Darwin's Doubt, Part 11. We've been going through the book Darwin's Doubt, written by Stephen C. Meyer, who is author of Signature in the Cell, was originally an oil industry geophysicist, uh, got his PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science. So he does have training in science as well as the philosophy of science. He is the director for the Center for Science and Culture. Uh, the book is uh, actually a massive expansion in addition to Meyer's article, The Origin of Biological Information in the Higher Taxonomic Categories, which is published in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, um, and uh, which uh, got uh, Richard Sternberg into such trouble. The book itself uh, in the prologue states that it is divided into three main parts, and it is. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. And part three, after Darwin, what? Everything that I'm giving is, uh, that I'm quoting is in a plain background. If, as I'm going to do now, I'm going to summarize in my own words, those will have a green background. The sudden appearance, this is the, basically a review of what we've covered so far. The sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. That's the subject of chapter one. And if you're looking at the uh, parts that we're dealing with, um, that's, part, that's uh, my presentation one. And the problem has only grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Qingjing fossils, which is covered in chapter two. The excuse that the precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence. That was the subject of chapter three, and uh, the second and third chapters were part of uh, my presentation too. I will omit the numbers after this. Claims that intermediates are really there are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. Genetics seems to demand intermediates if common descent is assumed. The tree of life cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion because it has its own problems. And punctuated equilibrium does not explain the Cambrian explosion. In part two, the reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinists is that Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information, not just what's known as Shannon information, complexity, pure and simple, but complexity that works, functional information. There's always doubt that Darwinism is up to the job, but the work of Yaki Sauer and now Axe have made the job much more daunting. Steve Meyer then wrote a paper that called attention to this work, only to see the paper put on a figurative index and Richard Sternberg to be effectively excommunicated. The only paper to pre attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article, and Meyer takes that article apart, showing that the article's main peer-reviewed support doesn't say what the article says it says. Newer developments in population genetics have made more clear the magnitude of the barriers to getting even small changes in DNA that are advantageous, especially in multicellular animals. Developmental gene regulatory networks, which can't change significantly without damaging or killing the creature, but must change to give rise to a new body plan. So how do you do that? And epigenetic information, which is not derived directly from the uh, genome also challenge Darwinism. Several modifications of or alternatives to Darwinian theory have been proposed, such as self-organization, evo-devo, neutral evo evolution, neo-Lamarckianism, neo and natural genetic engineering. Each of these has weaknesses, and perhaps the most profound common weakness is the inability to explain the origin of specified complexity or information. 
Intelligent design explains information well, and using abductive reasoning, standard in historical science, it is the best current explanation for the facts of the Cambrian explosion. And uh, now we come to signs of design in the Cambrian explosion. Except that I am trying to remember. And I think that we were missing that would be rather embarrassing. <coughs> yes, I think I I did do that. No? Actually, it's going to be very easy to find out for sure. Yes, I do, unfortunately. Um, and that's just a sample of it. I'm what you call behind. Let's see, that was December. Yes, I no, I was right. I just, I'd gone ahead and I had and got myself confused, so. Never mind. Okay. I was right. I just had... That's what happens when you do uh, them ahead of time. Start thinking, wait a minute. So we're on chapter 18 in the book. Yeah. Okay. then I am correct. Okay, so yeah, intelligent design explains re information well and using abductive reasoning standard in historical science, it is the best current explanation for the facts of the Cambrian explosion. And we're now in part three and we're ready to do Signs of Design in the Cambrian Explosion. Well-crafted mystery novels like real-world crime investigations unfold with a distinctive logic. There's a death to be explained, and at the start, an infinitely large universe of possible causes. That in universe can be made smaller, narrowing to the one true cause, as more and more clues come to light. These clues typically come in two forms, positive evidence or indicators of what likely happened, for example, 38 caliber shells casings on the ground and bullet wounds in a body, or n and negative evidence are indicators of what could not have happened. Let's say that the local sheriff who discovered the body of the state owner, from a, his illustration in the previous chapter, did so as he was making his rounds on a dirt road that makes a close approach to the beach at the end of the estate where the owner died. 
And let's say that, as a result, the sheriff just happened to find the body soon after the murder had taken place. Let's suppose further that the sheriff had the presence of mind to immediately measure the temperature of the body, only to find that the victim was still warm. Indeed, as warm as a living, almost as warm as a living person. Clearly in this situation, the sheriff would conclude that the victim had just died. At that point in the investigation, a physical regularity would govern the sheriff's reasoning, one that tells a lot about who didn't commit the murder. Following death, the human body cools to the surrounding temperature at a known rate. So making allowances for vehicular transport, whoever committed the murder could not have gone beyond a certain distance from the remote estate at the time the body was found. These facts would immediately provide a rock-solid alibi to the vast majority of humanity, anyone located safely outside that radius when, when the body was discovered. Of course, calling this information a negative clue is really only convention of naming. Negative and positive refer to how we conceive of the implications of a fact, but not to the fact itself. The evidence, after all, is what it is. Even so, facts both exclude and allow competing possible hypotheses. As they accumulate, they typically paint a picture, a profile, of the actual cause of the event in need of explanation. Thus, when we say the body temperature of the deceased rules out the seven billion people who were well beyond the radius set by the cooling rate, we could equally well have said the body temperature implicates some person within 30 miles of the estate when the sheriff arrived. A population of possible suspects much smaller than when we started. As I've described the many attempts to explain the scientific enigma motivating this book, that mystery has in one sense progressively deepened. As more and more attempts to explain the Cambrian explosion of animal life have failed, the evidence that these various competing theories fail to explain may be considered a set of negative clues evidence that effectively precludes certain possible causes or explanations. I've already explained why the received version of evolutionary theory, neo-Darwinism, fails to account for the explosion of information and form in the Cambrian period. I've also examined more recent evolutionary theories and shown why they too fail to explain key aspects of the evidence. To this point then, much of the evidence has turned, returned a negative verdict. It has told us a lot about what in all probability did not cause the Cambrian explosion. But as in our hypothetical murder case, an accumulating body of evidence that makes one set of explanations less and less plausible may also begin to paint a picture of an alternative cause and the true explanation. Profile of the suspect. Long before detectives know the actual identity of a suspect, they will often compose a profile of the person they are seeking. One leading paleontologist has used this strategy to begin to draw a bead on the cause responsible for the Cambrian explosion. Douglas Irwin has dedicated his career to solving the problem of the origin of animal body plans. See figure 18.1. Um, we're going to ignore that. Uh, trained at the University of California by James Valentine, another Cambrian expert, Irwin has worked closely over the past decade with Eric Davidson whom we first met in chapter 13, trying to determine what happened to cause dozens of novel body plans to appear, and appear rapidly, in the Cambrian period. Both Erwin and Davidson have now ruled out standard neo-Darwinian theory, vehemently in Davidson's case. He says that the standard theory gives rise to lethal errors. But Erwin and Davidson go further. They have assembled what is, in essence, a clue sheet, a list of key evidences that must be explained. Using that list, they have begun to sketch at least an outline, a profile of the cause behind the Cambrian explosion. On the positive side of the ledger, they conclude that this cause must have several attributes in order to explain key facts about the fossil record, as well as what it takes to build animals. In particular, the cause must be capable of generating a top-down pattern of appearance. It must be capable of generating new biological forms, rel new biological form relatively rapidly, and it must be capable of constructing, not merely modifying, complex integrated genetic circuits, specifically the developmental gene regulatory networks discussed in chapter 13. So we have three criteria for a positive theory. 
On the negative side, Davidson and Irwin ruled out both observed microevolutionary processes and postulated macroevolutionary mechanisms, such as punctuated equilibrium and species selection, as explanations for the origin of the key features of the Cambrian explosion. They insist that the requirements for constructing animal body plans de novo, quote, cannot be accommodated by microevolutionary or macroevolutionary theory. In chapter 13, I discuss their reason for coming to this conclusion. Developmental gene regulatory networks once in place cannot be perturbed or mutated without catastrophic consequences to the developing animal. Thus, functionally new gene regulatory networks, or fundamentally new gene regulatory networks, cannot evolve gradually from pre-existing pre DGRNs. If those evolutionary changes required perturbing the deepest nodes of the earlier G DGRNs. Yet building new DGRNs capable of producing new animals requires precisely such fundamental alterations in pre existing DGRNs. But then, how would the new general, uh, regulatory networks ever arise? Davidson and Irwin insist that no current theory of evolution explains the origin of these systems. Thus, they conclude that the cause of the Cambrian explosion is not described by any currently proposed theory of micro or macro evolution. And this is a Reader's Digest version, so we've done some cuts in order to get it into a, less than an hour. Um, Irwin explains, unlike later events, the most significant developmental events of the Cambrian radiation involved the proliferation of cell types, developmental hierarchies, and epigenetic cascades. Consequently, he concludes, the crucial difference between the developmental events of the Cambrian and subsequent events is that the former involved the establishment of these developmental patterns, not their modification. So, profiling a cause, all this raises an obvious question. Could the negative clues that increasingly disconfirm materialistic evolutionary theories also be positive indicators of a different kind of cause, perhaps even an intelligent cause? Let's quickly review Irwin and Davidson's profile. The cause must be capable of generating new form rapidly, generating a top-down pattern of appearance, constructing, not merely modifying, complex integrated circuits. They have also concluded that this cause is not described by any currently proposed theory of micro or macro evolution. Unlike any observed biological process operating in actual living populations today, well, with the, with the exception of one perhaps, Irwin and Davidson, no friends of intelligent design, have sketched a partial profile of an adequate cause as befits their particular interest in this important uh, in the importance of gene regulatory networks, Davidson, and fossil discontinuity, in the case of Irwin. But other evolutionary biologists have contributed to this picture as well. Simon Conway Morris marvels at the uncanny ability of evolution to navigate to the appropriate solution through immense hyperspaces of biological possibility. As a result, he argues that evolution may in some way be channeled towards propitious uh, functional and or structural endpoints without specifying any known evolutionary mechanism that can so direct evolution to such endpoints. James Shapiro proposes a mechanism of evolutionary change that relies on pre-programmed adaptive cap capacity without explaining where such pre-programming came from. Additional attributes needed to be added to this profile of the actual cause of the Cambrian explosion. Our previous investigations have suggested that building an animal requires specified or functional information and that any explanation for the origin of the Cambrian animals must identify a cause capable of generating digital information, structural or epigenetic information, and functionally integrated in hierarchically organized layers of information. Still, do any or even all of these clues add up to a reason for considering that an alternative kind of cause, a designing intelligence, might have played a role in the origin of animal life? They do. 
As it turns out, each of the features of the Cambrian animals in the Cambrian fossil record that constitute negative clues, clues that render neo-Darwinism and other materialistic theories inadequate as causal explanations, also happen to be features of systems known from experience to have arisen as a result of intelligent activity. In other words, standard materialistic evolutionary theories have failed to identify an adequate mechanism or cause for precisely those attributes of living forms that we know from experience. Only intelligence, conscious, rational activity, is capable of producing. That suggests, in accord with the method of historical scientific reasoning elucidated in the previous chapter, the possibility of making a strong historical inference to intelligent design as the best explanation for the origin of these attributes. The Cambrian information explosion. We have seen that building a new Cambrian or any other animal would require vast, new, functionally specified digital information. Moreover, the presence of such digitally encoded information in DNA presents at least a striking appearance of design in all living organisms. As Richard Dawkins observes, for example, the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. Similarly, biotechnology pioneer Leroy Hood refers to the information stored in DNA as digital code and describes it in terms reminiscent of computer software. And as we have seen, Microsoft's Bill Gates notes, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. Yet we've seen, also seen, that neither neo-Darwinism nor any other materialistic evolutionary model or mechanism explains the origin of the genetic information, the digital code, necessary to produce the Cambrian animals or even the simplest structural in innovations that they exhibit. Could this, from a materialistic point of view, unexplained appearance of design point instead to actual intelligent design? I think it does, but to explain why, I need to tell a bit more about the evolution of my own thinking on the matter. After learning about how historical scientists make inferences about the cause of events in the remote past, I first applied these methods of reasoning to the questioning of the origin of the information necessary to produce the first living cell. My book, Signature in the Cell, used the method of multiple competing hypotheses, or inferences, inference to the best explanation, to evaluate the causal adequacy of proposed explanations for the ultimate origin of biological information. I showed that chemical evolutionary models, whether based on chance, physical, physical chemical necessity, or the combination of the two, failed to identify a cause capable of producing the digital information in DNA and RNA. Yet we do know of a cause that has demonstrated the causal power to produce digital code. That causes intelligent agency. In fact, it's now a, a cause that is known to produce digital DNA code. Since intelligent agency is the only cause known to be capable of de generating information, at least starting from non-living chemicals, intelligent design offers the best explanation for the origin of the information necessary to produce the first organism. The case for intelligent design in signature was carefully limited as a challenge to chemical evolution. Many evolutionary biologists acknowledge that chemical evolutionary theory has failed to account for the origin of the first life. Many cite its inability to account for the origin of biological information as one of the main reasons for that failure. Moreover, because they do not think <coughs> that natural selection could have played a significant role in evolution until after the first self-replicating organisms had arisen, most evolutionary biologists also think that explaining the origin of information in a prebiotic context is much more difficult than explaining the origin of new information in already living organisms. And I'd have to agree with that point. For this reason in signature, I did not try to argue that intelligent design might help explain the origin of information necessary to account for the origin of new animals from simpler pre-existing forms of life. That would have required a separate demonstration showing the inadequacy of natural selection and mutation as a mechanism for generating new genetic information in already living organisms. This book in chapters 9 through 14 has provided that demonstration. These chapters show how neo-Darwinism fails to explain the origin of genetic information. 
at least in amounts necessary to build a new protein fold. Chapters 15 and 16 showed, in addition, that the other main materialistic evolutionary theories also fail to account for the information necessary to build new forms of animal life. These theories presuppose rather than explain the origin of the information necessary for structural innovation in the history of life. And since the Cambrian explosion of animal life is an explosion of information and structural innovation, that raises a question. Is it possible that this increase of biological information not only represents evidence against materialistic theories of biological evolution, but also positive evidence for intelligent design? <coughs> a cause now in operation. It does. Intelligent agents, due to their rationality and consciousness, have demonstrated the power to produce specified or functional information in the form of linear, sequence-specific arrangements of characters. A computer user who traces the information on a screen back to its source and invariably comes to mind, a software engineer or programmer. Our experience-based knowledge of information flow can confirm that systems with large amounts of specified or functional information <coughs> invariably originate from an intelligent source. The generation of functional information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Our uniform experience confirms this obvious truth. It also suggests, therefore, that intelligent design meets the key causal adequacy requirements of a good historical scientific explanation. Certainly, intelligence is a cause now in operation, capable of generating functional or specified information in a, in a digital form. And since we know of no presently acting materialistic cause that also generates large amounts of specified information, especially in a digital or alphabetic form, only intelligent design meets the causal adequacy requirement of a historical scientific explanation. It follows that the great infusion of such information in the Cambrian explosion points decisively to an intelligent cause. Intelligent design stands alone as an explanation for the origin of genetic information for another reason. Purposive agents have just those necessary powers that natural selection lacks as a condition of its causal adequacy. We've seen that natural selection lacks the ability to generate novel information precisely because it can only act after a new functional information has arisen. The job of generating new functional agents, proteins, and systems of proteins therefore falls entirely to random mutations. Yet without functional criteria to guide a search through this space of possible sequences, random variation is probabilistically doomed. Demonstration of this requirement has come from an unlikely quarter, genetic algorithms, that allegedly simulate the creative power of mutation and selection. Richard Dawkins, Bernd Olaf Coopers, and others have developed computer programmers. Yet these programs succeed only by the illicit expedient of providing the computer with a target sequence and then treating proximity to futures function, that is, the target sequence, not the actual present function as a selection criterion. As mathematician David Berlinski shows, genetic algorithms need something akin to a forward-looking memory in order to succeed. Yet such foresighted selection has no analog in nature. In biology, where differential survival depends upon maintaining function, natural selection cannot occur before new functional sequences arise. Natural selection lacks foresight, the process, as evolutionary theorist Rodin and Zathmari note, works strictly in the present moment, right here and right now, lacking the foresight of potential future advantages. When what natural selection lacks, intelligent design, purposive, goal-directed selection, provides. Rational agents can arrange both matter and symbols with distant goals in mind. They also routinely solve problems of combinatorial inflation. In using language, the human mind routinely finds or generates highly improbable linguistic sequences to convey an intended or preconceived idea. Similarly, the construction of complex technological objects and products, such as bridges, circuit boards, engines, and software, results from the application of goal-directed constraints. Thus, by invoking intelligent design to overcome a vast combinatorial search problem, 
And to explain the origin of new specified information, contemporary advocates of intelligent design are not positing an arbitrary explana explanatory element unvo unmotivated by a consideration of the evidence. <coughs> Instead, we posit an entity possessing precisely the causal powers that a key feature of the Cambrian explosion, the explosive increase in specified information requires as a condition of its production and explanation. Integrated circuitry, developmental gene regulatory networks. Keep in mind too that animal forms have more than just genetic information. They also need tightly integrated networks of genes, proteins, and other molecules to regulate their development. In other words, they require developmental gene regulatory networks, the DGRNs that Eric Davidson has so meticulously mapped over the course of his career. These interdependent networks of genes and gene products present a striking appearance of design. Davidson's graphical depictions of these DGRNs look for all the world like wiring diagrams in an electrical engineering blueprint or a schematic of an integrated circuit. An uncanny resemblance Davidson himself has often noted. What emerges from the analysis of animal DGRNs he muses is almost astounding. A network of logical interactions Pre programmed into the DNA sequence that amounts to essentially a hardwired biological computation device. Yet as explained in chapter 13, Davidson himself has made clear that the type functional constraints under which these systems of molecules, the DGRNs, operate preclude their gradu gradual alteration by the mutation and selection mechanism. For this reason, neo-Darwinism has failed to explain the origin of these systems of molecules and their functional integration. Like advocates of evolutionary development of biology, Davidson himself favors a model of evolutionary change that envisions mutations generating large-scale developmental effects, thus perhaps by bypassing non-functional intermediate circuits or systems, sort of hopping from one island to another um, of functional information in a vast sea of non-functional uh, arra possible arrangements. Nevertheless, neither proponents of Evodivo nor proponents of other recently proposed materialistic theories of evolution have identified a mutational mechanism capable of generating a DGRN or anything re even remotely resembling a complex integrated circuit. Yet in our experience, complex integrated circuits and the functional in integration of parts of complex systems generally are known to be produced by intelligent agents, specifically by engineers. Moreover, intelligence is the only known cause of such effects. The hierarchical organization of genetic and epigenetic information. In addition to the information stored in individual genes and the information present in the integrated networks of genes and proteins and DGRNs, Animal forms exemplify hierarchical arrangements or layers of information-rich molecule systems and structures. For example, developing embryos require epigenetic information in the form of specifically arranged A, membrane targets and patterns, B, cytoskeletal arrays, uh, like the microtubules, C, ion channels, and D, sugar molecules on the exterior of cells. That's the sugar code. As noted in chapter 13, much of this epigenetic information resides in the structure of the material of the maternal egg and is inherited directly from the membrane to membrane, independently of DNA. The highly specified, tightly integrated hierarchical arrangements of molecular components and systems within animal body parts also suggest intelligent design. This is, again, because of our experience with the features and systems that intelligent agents, and only intelligent agents, produce. Further, human agents often design information-rich hierarchies in which both information, individual molecules and the arrangements of those molecules exhibit complexity and specificity. Specified information, as defined in Chapter 8. And again, we're skipping over various things. Location, location, location. There is another remarkable aspect of the hierarchical organization of information in animal forms. Many of the same genes and proteins play very different roles depending on the larger organismal and informational context in which they find themselves in different animal groups. For example, 
The same gene, PAX6, or its homologue called ILIS, helps to regulate the development of the eyes of fruit flies, that's arthropods, and those of squid, cephalopods, and mice, vertebrates. Yet arthropod eyes exemplify a completely different structure from vertebrate or cephalopod eyes. It tells you to start an eye, but it doesn't say what kind. The fruit fly possesses a compound eye with hundreds of separate lenses, a mantidia, whereas both mice and squid employ a camera-type eye with a single lens and a retinal surface. In addition, although the eyes of squid and mice resemble each other optically, single lens, large internal chamber, single retinal surface, they focus differently. They undergo completely different patterns of development and utilize different internal structures and nerve connections to the visual centers of the brain all controlled by the same gene. Yet the PAX6 gene and its homologs play a key role in regulation, regulating the construction of all three of these different adult sensory structures. Moreover, evolutionary and developmental biologists have found that this pattern of same genes, different anatomy, recurs throughout the bilaterian phyla <coughs> for features as fundamental as appendages, segmentation, the gut, the heart, and sense organs. This pattern contradicts the expectations of textbook evolutionary theory. Neo-Darwinism predicts that disparate adult structures should be produced by different genes. Given the compound, pardon me, given the profound differences between the fruit fly compound eye and the vertebrate camera eye, Neo-Darwinian theory would not predict that the same genes would be involved in building different eyes in arthropods and chordates. <coughs> Many leading evolutionary theorists have acknowledged this problem. University of Wisconsin Evo Devo researcher Sean B. Carroll has noted that the neo-Darwinian prediction of similar genes producing similar structures is entirely incorrect. Stephen Jay Gould described the discovery of the polyfunctional role of similar genes as explicitly unexpected and discombobulating the confident expectations of orthodox theory. The theory of intelligent design suggests a solution to the problem, a solution familiar to us from the construction and operation of our own artifacts. Figure 18.3 is a general purpose switching transistor. These electronic components can be used to help build many electrical electronic systems, from a computer to a microwave oven to a radio. And the exact functional role that the transistor will play will be governed by the system in which it finds itself. One must, of course, make allowances for the particular specifications of the transistor itself. A transistor cannot function as a battery. Nowhere, however, is this feature of polyfunctional modularity more intuitively clear than our use of the natural language, such as English. To illustrate this, my colleague Paul Nelson once disassembled the last 44 words of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address uh, into a lexicon. Using the same words at roughly the same frequency, he then wrote an anarchist manifesto with a meaning diametrically opposed to that of Lincoln's. What a change were not the words that is the lower level modules, rather the higher level context or the system as a whole differed. And there's the illustration, you, most of you are quite familiar with the, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion and so forth. But here, by this we highly resolve that we shall have freedom from this nation, that devotion to government shall perish. These people honored the last government in vain, the dead increased, measure that full devotion. The earth under here gave these people birth, not a dead God. And for that which they shall take their, and for that, they shall take their new cause for which people have not died. Completely different meaning. Same words. Just rearranged a little. Features of the Precambrian and Cambrian fossil record. Intelligent design not only helps to explain many key features of the Cambrian animals themselves, it also helps to explain many otherwise anomalous features of the Cambrian fossil record. An inverted cone, disparity preceding diversity. 
As discussed in chapter two, the fossil record shows a top-down pattern in which the phyla level morphological disparity appears first, followed only later by species level diversity. Many innovations in body plans proceed, pardon me, major innovations in body plans proceed minor variations on basic design. This inverted cone of diversity also suggests intelligent design. Sudden appearance in missing ancestors. The theory of intelligent design can also help to account for the abrupt appearance of complex animal anatomical structures in animal body plans in the fossil record. When the radio was first invented, it was unlike anything that had come before, even other forms of communication technology. Acts of mind. Studies in the history and philosophy of science have shown that to explain an event or set of facts, scientists must typically cite a cause capable of producing the event or the, that event or those facts. When scientists do not have the luxury of directly observing the cause of a particular event or effect under study, as historical scientists typically do not, they must cite a cause that is otherwise known to ex produce the facts in question. Yet it turns out that both the Cambrian animal forms themselves and their patterns of appearance in the fossil record exhibit precisely those features that we should expect to see if an intelligent cause had acted to produce them. Further, the Cambrian animal forms and their manner of appearance contradict what we should expect to find in the fossil record and in the animal world given a purely materialistic, bottom-up process of evolution. When Darwin first acknowledged the problem of the Cambrian fossil record and the small but persistent doubt that it raised for him about his theory, his nemesis, Lee Gassi, not only rejected his theory of evolution but also affirmed a, an alternative understanding of the nature and origin of animal life. To Agassi, the pattern of animal classification in the fossil record reinforced the idea that living forms exemplified basic types ideas that had originated in the mind of a designing intelligence. Thus he would argue that the Cambrian fossils tell of what he called acts of mind. As noted in chapter one, Darwin himself acknowledged both Agassiz's immense paleontological, pa paleontological knowledge and the validity of the problems that Agassiz raised. Even so, his affirmation of a positive alternative to Darwin's theory in the form of a design hypothesis might well have seemed premature in the 1860s and certainly did reflect something of the prejudice of the times. But more than a century and a half later, after many of failed attempts to discover and explain away the missing fossil ancestors, and after discoveries in molecular and development of biology have revolutionized our understanding of the complexity of animal life, continuing to regard the Cambrian explosion as merely a niggling problem for established theory, a lone question mark or negative clue, now seems not so much cautious as simply unresponsive to the evidence. Now, my own take on that chapter is that I think Steve Meyer makes a good argument for intelligent design being the best explanation for the phenomena of the Cambrian explosion. The case is frankly obvious as long as the question can be asked at all. Advocates of Darwin Darwinian evolution do not want the question to be asked because the answer is so obvious. And I think that many of them are afraid of where the evidence will take them if they do ask. <coughs> and um, we plan to discuss that point later on. But um, that's my take. Now it's your turn. So on these blogs that you're on, how do they, is there much discussion of this point? Mostly they avoid it and try to f argue about peripheral matters. So is there a particular set of points that they will try to steer it to or uh, all over the map? Minor objections of various kinds. Uh, yes, and then comment with Nick. Um, I think one can raise the question uh, where I think a lot of these scientists feel uncomfortable with is that when you speak of an intelligent designer, it allows for all kinds of possibilities. Anything can happen. He could do anything because you don't say what kind of intelligent designer it is. 
it's a little bit like the multiverse concept. We just happen to be in the particular universe where this happened. And the others that didn't happen and so on, and we can't see them or whatever. So uh, I think uh, Meyer's approach that doesn't mention that particular issue, which is you know the God of the gaps issue, uh, question and so on. Well, uh, how are you going to test it if you have a God who can do anything? Uh, and it, this is something I think we need to approach to a certain extent. Now, I do think strongly that we're not without additional evidence. If you stay purely on the materialistic level, as, as this book tends to do, which uh, is good at that level, uh, but the concept of God, the Bible, history, and so on, uh, provides a, a much richer picture of a possibility here than does, for instance, uh, a multiverse. We have, you know, historical authentication of the Bible. We have geographical authentication of the Bible. We have uh, so we have that feature, and you you can't get rid of the Bible. It's there, and it's the world's most popular book, fifteen, twenty times as more more popular than any other book except uh, Mao Zedong's uh, book, which was forced on people. But, uh, but uh, so uh, I feel to a certain extent you, this issue that scientists feel, well, uh, you're in the God of the Gaps area. We're not comfortable there. Uh, this is one thing that we need to address. Okay, go ahead, Nick. Yeah. Um, we are talking about the most intelligent people on the planet. Educated to look for evidence. And they are afraid of evidence? Can, can you explain that? Well, actually, um, if you ever get them past all of the smoke screens that go on, um, and they actually say what their fears are, uh, they're afraid that, <coughs> that if we go this route, that science will disappear. Um, and they are afraid that instead, a right-wing cabal will take over that will establish a theocracy. And in fact, you can find those points specifically made about intelligent design uh, by uh, two people by the name of Barbara Forrest and Paul Gross, who have actually written a book to say basically that. And um, it's a very interesting book to read. Um, they trace the Discovery Institute to some of the financial backing behind it, um, <clears throat> which happened to include the Amundsen family of, uh, if you're familiar with Los Angeles and the Amundsen Theater, that's those people. Um, and so, they're looking for people like Christian Reconstructionists, which as far as I know is a fairly small major uh, minority of, um, of Christians. But that's the specter that they raise. Historically, can this fear be, uh, how do you say, um, proved, in other words, because uh, science, for many, for many centuries, uh, science did progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, can we say that uh, a theocracy reigned supreme at that time? Uh, uh, when scientists were Christians, uh, such as uh, James Clerk Maxwell, for example, or, or William Thompson, or... Um, um, 
it, it doesn't seem to have been a problem at that time. But um, it, this, is, this is the fear that they will express. So is the fear justified uh, or not? Okay. I don't think it is right now. Um, but you could have, uh, you could have if there's enough fighting and people take, take sides to where it gels, you could have something where a theocracy could try to arise. Uh, comment here, and then uh, and then Mickey. In fact, well, if you well, want to well, pass the other microphone yeah. over to Mickey, that'd be fine. Well, we Go can ahead. look at um, the. Is it working? It worked for me. Uh, no, <laughs> that's okay. Whichever microphone you want to relinquish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Go ahead. Yeah, we can we can look at the um, uh, the SETI program as an example uh, because. Uh, Francis Drake initially came up with the Drake equation for an explanation of when they made communication, if they did, with an extraterrestrial intelligence, it wasn't going to be angels or the God that they're talking to. He came up with a natural uh, uh, model for what, you know, who the, the who, who would we, who would we, who we would be communicating with. And presumably be people more advanced than we yeah, are. It's just, you know, it's all within, uh, it all fits within methodological naturalism as the basis for uh, their um, uh, development and, 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 and their, their program. So, um, yeah, it, 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 you know, as long as, see, this is the problem with the, the, uh, uh, the intelligent design movement. It, uh, in a sense that, sure, you can say that uh, the uh, you got these polyfunctional machines that uh, are, uh, you know, making allowing biological systems to operate, uh, and those were designed. But there's no explanation within methodological naturalism that is given that allows the origin of those machines to be identified. Francis Drake did that with the SETI program. ID doesn't do that, and so where do you go? You know, there's no basis as far as uh, the scientific community sees for knowing how these machines came into existence, and what was the causal path? What was the causal uh, sequence or initiation that brought them into existence? We, uh, ID doesn't give no, uh, it doesn't give any kind of information in that direction and thus there's no direction to go and so what do you do with it? It's unknown. Well it actually allows you to go in any number of different directions. You could go in the, in the direction of Francis Drake for example. Yeah. And that is a legitimate uh, those intelligencers are as good as or better than us presumably um, because we didn't start making wa uh, radio waves and broadcasting them out to until the 19 uh, yeah, but until until that's done, or so. Until that's done, the idea idea uh, idea is not going to have a uh, create uh, the, the 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 scope that is necessary like that that the Drake equation provided, and, and thus it's not going to progress. Um, and and so you 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 have this issue about just saying it's a machine as the solution, is that enough? Uh, it's not going uh, uh, it, to, you know, it's, it, that's not enough to, to uh, give it the foothold and the foundation it needs for moving forward. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, do we propose where is the causal initial, uh, the initial causation that brought these machines into existence? Is sure that you can, uh, you can, um, you know. We but there's 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 no solid, probabilistic description that is given by the ID uh, community. You can't calculate. You know, can't predict. You can't do a calculated prediction of, you know, how these um, these models or these machines came into existence. The the the, the Drake equation allows you to do that. And, and though a lot of the inputs are, are very 
uh, you know, um, a lot of hand waving in them. It is a framework for explaining the full process of origin to communication. The whole gamut is in there. It's, it's done in a structured manner. This is not done with ID. ID does not uh, give you that complete picture. It just says, here's a machine. I, it looks like a machine. It acts like a machine. It talks like a machine. Or, or, you know, there must be a machine. But that's it. Well, I, I think there's a reason why they do that. And it's not just a legal one, although uh, I'm sure there is some legal influence to it. But the major thing, the major thing is this. Um, these look like the products of intelligent activity. Uh, I mean, you can read quote after quote after quote of people who say, it looks like design. The appearance of design is uh, ubiquitous in nature. This kind of thing. Um, the, uh, from Dawkins himself. Biology is a study of complicated objects that give the appearance of design. And he's right in that statement. Now, the reason people are not willing to go there has nothing to do with the evidence itself. Because we know that intelligence exists. I think, therefore, I am. Anybody who doesn't know that intelligence exists is probably uh, either in deep denial or else um, much lower intelligence than average. You can take your pick. Um, whether or not that intelligence requires the violation of laws of nature is not clear. We don't know enough about how brains work, how minds work, what the uh, difference or identity between mind and brain is to be able to say uh, whether, whether the mind is totally encompassed in the brain or whether there's something beyond. But it doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is we are here, we are intelligent. Intelligent agents are part of nature now. Yeah. The denial of intelligence is really pointless. And once you allow that there is such a thing as intelligence, and you allow that intelligence can do some things, for example, the production of very long, specific strings of DNA, and you allow that no unintelligent cause is known that can do that, then the obvious first choice when, you find, when you're trying to explain the origin, not the propagation, but the origin of those long complex strings of DNA, the obvious first choice is that an intelligent agent did it. Now, you can say, well, uh, intelligent agents have always been around, so it's always been passed down. So there never was a first one. The problem is that conflicts with standard cosmology, as you know. Um, that means that there was a first one, and it had to come from someplace else. And furthermore, if you go back far enough, and it appears now that about 13.7 billion years is far enough, um, that if the first one required an intelligent agent as well, which is kind of the obvious conclusion, then that intelligence cannot have had its intelligence based upon the arrangement of matter. That is to say, it didn't have a brain, or at least not a brain in our universe. Yeah, it had a mind, but not a brain in our universe. And that's the scary part. 
Now we are stuck with a, a mind outside of the universe that can meddle inside. That's where they don't want to go. And that's the reason they resist the obvious implication is because if you go there, that's where you go. Well, they're, they're certainly afraid of a bait and switch uh, type. Uh, this isn't solution. bait and switch. Well, it, it is if you're, if you're claiming to be working in methodological naturalism and then suddenly say, ah, we got design, we, we've shown our design and thus theistic science must be true. Maybe methodological and naturalism is inadequate. That may be, that may be it is in many ways. Okay, but, then but let's start out by saying that if you're looking for the truth, you don't start with methodological naturalism. Okay, well let's you can use that. that as the number one point. But and what that means is that all these people that are looking under the lamppost of methodological naturalism for their car keys are looking there because the light's better, not because the car keys are there. Well, that's where we're, we're falling short on our persuasion. We're not doing a very good job then because it, it's uh, mainstream science says that methodological naturalism is the origin of truth. Well, maybe and they're wrong. That may be true. And maybe where that needs to be challenged flat right. up. And what he's doing is he's showing that this is a perfectly logical explanation. But the reason why it's not accepted has to do with a problem with people with hanging on to methodological naturalism as a way to exclude and another intelligence. But, but uh, in many ways, there's many people that would just say that the argument is not exhaustive enough. You can always say that. Uh, that's true. Uh, that's true. Then, then where are we falling short? In Maybe they're that falling short. We need to stop blaming ourselves for all of this. No, uh, but persuasion is a part of how we present the knowledge that we have. You can't always persuade a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Uh, I, that I understand that, but, but <laughs> where this battle is going to continue then, and and uh, there there so the uh, you know our our um, the quality at which we do it, the 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 the, the professionalism in which we handle it is going to be a key. Did he have some suggestions uh, I, about what that might look like? Or what consistent? would you like to improve? So what, what would be this? Well, we, you know, just... Well, okay, we have let's... Let, right now, as I hear it, we're agreed upon the idea that methodological naturalism is really a red herring. It's, it really doesn't... It's, it's, it's incorrect if we're trying to search for the truth. Sure. So, it's, now, the question is... How do we go about convincing people that that's the, the case? Well, it's, it, it's one we have, you know, it's, it's a struggle. But we, to get back to the place where science was okay with theistic science, that's, that's the way it has been in the past. It's not now because, uh, you know, because... So how do you change that? Well, that's, you know, if I had an answer to that, that would, I, you know, I, I'd love to give it, but I don't. Yeah. But that's, the, that's, you know, the, that's the... We, we have several other people that are going to comment on that. But that's a key. That's a key point. Uh, just want one side comment here. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't think basically there's any difference between methodolo methodological and naturalism and atheistic naturalism in terms of the practice of science itself. Uh, and so uh, this is just a, a term that really is almost meaningless. Uh, well, it, it isn't it, meaningless. It, it, it's a way of sneaking it in as a methodological principle when what you really want is a philosophical principle. Uh, absolutely. And it, it, this is, this is uh, you know, we might as well, now atheistic, you might argue, well, atheistic science, uh, and some people define atheism as being aggressively uh, naturalistic compared to just being passively naturalistic. Uh, that's one of the definitions of atheism. But really, we're just talking about naturalism. 
we don't need to say methodological, but it makes no difference as far as the practice of science is concerned in terms of the definition of methodological naturalism. It's just a convenient way, way of saying you're not an atheist. So it seems like this God of the gaps just regulate, relegating it to you know, dism being dismissive about that. It's, we now have a much broader understanding of mechanisms that are required, and uh, so the naturalists have equally, a, at least equally, a naturalism of the gaps approach, too. So they do. it's a different context, it seems like, now than it was before when we were just starting to explain a lot of natural phenomena. So it really comes down to, seems, a, you know, an a priori determination. This is what's gumming it up is an a priori determination of whether it's naturalism or an interventionist approach. Now, we had yeah. two other hands here, and let's hear Dan. And, and Nick, and did, we, and did I miss somebody over here? Uh, well, shall we give you a chance to comment before you go? Uh, go ahead and pass the mic down. Yeah, um, just my observation is that once you can account for a beginning and whether it's divine or natural, let's say it's divine, there's a beginning, then you can sometimes use methodological naturalism to account for a whole series of activities that you see buried in the fossil record. So it works a little bit better if you just disregard the whole question of origins. Now, in the historical sciences, historians basically are methodological naturalists because it really disrupts their cycle of cause and effect if you have God in there or any other supernatural power. When Ronald Numbers wrote his book on Ellen White, it was a bombshell within Adventism because he used the approach of methodological naturalism. He said, we're going to just lay aside any supernatural uh, explanations to explain the gift that is given to Ellen White. And then he goes from there. And we just, we're not used to thinking in those terms. Sometimes it works in a very small scale, right? Especially if you're dealing with microevolution. So uh, I think what Steve is saying there, we need to be able to um, talk with those who operate from the principles of methodological naturalism. We don't always communicate as well, but maybe the book that we're looking at is a big step in the right direction. That's my little speech. Go ahead. I think it's important that we all realize that in science there could be many competing explanations for a certain observation. And merely because there is a wonderful explanation does not make it true. Um, I will never forget when I was at a conference where my former mentor was the keynote speaker and he really made a wonderful presentation, so much so that everybody was almost left speechless. And then he came and sat down, and I said to him, you know, that was a wonderful presentation. And he leaned over and said, I hope it's true. <laughs> you know, and why do we say, and in my books, my esteem of him and his integrity rose tremendously. Why? Because he proposed explanations which made wonderful sense. And it all fit together excellent. But he always reserved in the back of his mind a caution that we could be overlooking something. And that is an essential ingredient for us to be able to do science. Now, when we do science, we have to, first of all, lay out all the likely, probable, 
causes for some observation. And then we do experiments to try to, try to either exclude or uh, see what's left that still holds. That's how we learn which of the wonderful theories is actually right. That's how science progresses. The problem that I see with this entire evolutionary issue, the issue, I shouldn't say evolutionary issue, the issue of origins, really, is that we do not have access to original observations. So we are only left with inferences, as far as that's concerned. The problem, however, that complicates the matter even further is that some of us have decided a priori that certain explanations are not going to be even explored. And to me, that's immediately antithetical to doing good science because if you want to do good science, you have to consider all the possibilities before you do the experiments to see which one is, should be ruled out or ruled in. Not rule them out beforehand. That is not science. That is something else. Dogma or philosophy or who knows what. So I think there is a lot for science to progress in. But uh, this issue of fear, if you're afraid of the outcome and thus you don't want to do the experiment in order to uh, avoid a certain outcome, we would consider that lack of adequate scientific integrity. That is a form of bias that we're imposing on the explanation automatically. There is no easy solution. Life is messy. If we want a neat outcome, we should be studying something else. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. I was thinking that we could blame ourselves and we could improve. There is a certain element of truth in it. We had the duty to improve on our methods and try to succeed in spite of the situation. But let's not forget that we are not the first ones to fail. Jesus failed initially because he fed 5,000 people and what did his enemies say? No big deal. Moses, I mean, he provided, he provided us one meal. Look at Moses. Moses provided them food for 40 years. <laughs> Three and meals a day. Three <laughs> meals a day. And then Jesus uh, raised the daughter of uh, Lazarus. N not the daughter of Lazarus. Jairus. Jairus. Mm -hmm. And what did they say? I mean, he himself said she was asleep. So he just Wasn't woke really her up. Dead. So look at, I mean, the son of God, the most intelligent human being. And, and the God most committed. divine at the same time. Yet he initially failed to convince his enemies that he was the Messiah, the promised Messiah. All the evidence was there. So there was no lack of evidence. There was a, la a lack of willingness to look at the events and connect the dots. I'll go ahead and let uh, um, Dr. Roth have the last word here. Uh, just to pursue a little bit, uh, Danilo. Oh, I'm sorry, we have one more that after. Uh, to pursue Danilo's um, thinking, I think one can legitimately raise the question that there does seem to be a naturalistic bias in the scientific community. Uh, they are willing to look at all kinds of wild ideas. I mentioned the multiverse, for instance. 
uh, which can answer anything. Uh, or you can... Uh, but which destroys science. But they're unwilling to say that. They still consider multiverse as acceptable in the peer-reviewed literature. Yes. Uh, or you can uh, say, well, life came from outer space and some space explorers left garbage here on Earth that had some life in it. That's, the way. That's okay. Uh, but you cannot say, well, maybe God did it. Uh, I think there, there is a, a legit, legitimate concern here. Why is the bias against God and not against these other wild ideas uh, in terms of their logic, per se? I'm, I'm leaving out the extraneous uh, uh, concepts of the existence for God and from, from other perspectives such as morality and uh, consciousness, love, and free will, and so on. I'm leaving that out of the picture. Uh, but within the, the materialistic uh, milieu, uh, why leave that one idea out? I think there's a legitimate concern there. Uh, Clyde says I have to say this. This is what I was thinking this morning when I was reading the chapter. It reminded me of a passage in Romans 1. It's verses 18 to 22. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful nor became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And it seems to me that this whole issue is based on if we t say that God was not the creator, then when we look at nature, we don't need to be reminded of him or feel that we have any obligation towards him. And that's a simplified version from a liberal arts person. OK. Um, come back next week, and we're going to uh, discuss methodological naturalism, dead uh, center. That's the, that's the one thing, one objection that will be raised. Uh, so if that's what you're interested, we'll, um, we'll go through that. and. Um, uh, as I said, we'll continue, and eventually we'll get to, uh, once you accept intelligent design, where do you kind of go from there? Um, happy Sabbath, and we'll see you next week.